Hi everyone, welcome to our online education series. My name is Gina and I work as an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. We are a nonprofit organization that seeks to inspire curiosity and questions about Mount St. Helens. We teach about the science and stories of this place. I'm filming here today in front of the volcano, Mount St. Helens herself. Behind me you can see the gaping crater that was left behind from the 1980 eruption. Today we're going to focus on what happened after 1980, what processes are still occurring to allow a lava dome and new glacier to form at our mountain. We're going to speak about some exciting new science that's happening at Mount St. Helens and we're going to include an interview with one of the leading scientists herself who study phenomena in Mount St. Helens. So come join me for this series and get excited. Today we're also going to demonstrate an experiment that you have the option to do at home. A supply list for what you need as well as an activity sheet about how to do this experiment at home is listed on our website. Let's begin by thinking about what happened during the 1980 eruption. We started with a mountain that had a relatively pointed conical shaped top. During the 1980 eruption, the top of the mountain slid off in a massive landslide and the subsequent blast of hot magma and gas that came out during the explosion gutted the volcano, leaving a gaping crater. Let's take a look at some images of what Mount St. Helens looked like before and after the 1980 eruption. Though it is cloudy, we can see in the volcano behind me that there is a substantial space or a gaping wide crater that was left after the explosive 1980 eruption. What happened to this crater after 1980? Well, Mount St. Helens was not done erupting in 1980. First, there were subsequent eruptions as well as some lava flows that began to fill up the dome of the crater. Let's take a look at a set of images to help us understand what changes occurred within the crater of Mount St. Helens after the 1980 eruption. We began first with lava dome eruptions that built up a lava dome between 1980 and 1986. The style of these eruptions produced uh, deposits that looked, people describe them, as pancakes. So they were kind of fat, broad, pancake style eruptions one on top of the other. Sometimes these eruptions would be interrupted by a more explosive eruption and the process of rebuilding the lava dome would start again. A different type of process occurred in the eruption that happened between 2004 and 2008. During this time, the magma coming out of the volcano was a little bit more sticky. It was a little bit more solid and so when it came out it was like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube of toothpaste in the way that it was not as liquid but instead came out in these large spines. We can see how this looked from a series of photographs that was captured by the U.S. Ge Geological Survey remote monitoring equipment. These photographs were taken every couple of months throughout the course of the year and over a period of time we're able to see the changes and the dramatic growth of the spines of lava that extruded between 2004 and 2008. Both the eruptions between 1980 and 1986 and 2004 and 2008 built up a dome of lava in the center of our crater that has really changed the way Mount St. Helens looks today. If we look at pictures from 1980 as compared to now, we'll see the lava dome is large and prominent and stands in the center of the crater taller than the Empire State Building and almost reaches the height of the crater rim.
we are going to watch a few time-lapse videos that show the growth of the dome. This video shows a time-lapse of lava dome growth between 2004 and 2008 from a remote camera stationed on the east side of the crater of Mount St. Helens. This video is produced by scientists at the U.S. Geological Survey. In the bottom right corner, we can see the date that each photograph was taken. This remote camera captured a photograph multiple times a day. Notice the large whaleback spines erupting from the lava dome like toothpaste coming out of a tube. Lava domes are formed from viscous magma erupting non-explosively onto the surface and piling up around the vent. There is not enough gas or pressure in this lava to erupt explosively. This lava is too thick and sticky to flow very far, so instead it piles up thick and high around the vent. This was an exciting time for Mount St. Helens and even more exciting for scientists and viewers like us that could watch all of this incredible activity within the crater. By 2008, the eruptions of this eruptive period had ceased. Along with the crater filling up with lava, there was also snow and ice that filled this gaping space of the crater. The snow and ice formed around the lava dome that was bulging in the center of the crater. Over time, as the snow packed down layer upon layer, year after year, the snow itself metamorphosed or changed into glacial ice. This formed a brand new glacier in the crater of Mount St. Helens. This was an incredibly exciting moment for scientists when they realized that not only did Mount St. Helens have a brand new baby glacier, the youngest glacier in this part of the United States, but also the fact that when they looked at the glacier and how it was moving, they recognized that the glacier was moving in incredibly fast and that it was growing. For much of the area in the lower 48 states, almost all of the glaciers that we have are not growing in size. We are moving into a period with a warmer climate and we are seeing a reduction in the volume in all of the glaciers studied across the board, except for this glacier at Mount St. Helens. Today we're going to learn why the glacier at Mount St. Helens is able to grow so quickly and why it has continued to grow up until the present day. Here is a photograph showing the crater of Mount St. Helens in 2005. Here we can see the gray rocks of the lava dome in the center surrounded by the glacier. Notice the huge cracks in the glacier. As more lava erupted onto the crater floor, the glacier was pushed further down the sides of the crater walls. Let's take a moment to look at a time lapse of photographs that was taken from the rim of the crater showing both the growth of the lava dome as well as the movement of the glacier around the lava dome. This set of images was captured between 2004 and 2008, which was the most recent period that the lava dome was erupting. It is with permission from the U.S. Geological Survey that we were able to show this fantastic footage and lots of gratitude to the scientists and the remote cameras that were able to capture this footage. This video shows the growth of the crater glacier at Mount St. Helens between 2005 and 2012. The photographs captured the growth of the lava dome between 2004 and 2008, as well as the continued growth of the glacier after 2008. Here we see the different lava dome eruptions of 1980 to 1986 and 2004 to 2008. The date the photographs were taken is in the top left corner. These photographs were taken by a remote camera on the northwest flank of Mount St. Helens. Watch the glacier move down the sides of the lava dome. Notice both the lava dome rapid growth and buildup, as well as the rapid movement of the glacier. Notice how dark colored the glacier becomes in the summertime with the rocks covering it and then how light it becomes during the winter when it becomes again covered with snow.
As the glacier moves to advance to the front of the crater, its rate of movement slows as it reaches a more shallow crater floor. The east and west arms of the glacier wrapped around the lava dome and finally connected in 2008. This was an exciting time for scientists as we recognized we had the first donut-shaped glacier. After 2008, the lava dome growth ceased, but the glacier continues to advance down the crater floor. Scientists continue to monitor the growth of this glacier today. As the glacier moves to the front of the crater, it also becomes out of the shade of the crater walls and thus begins to slow its growth as it sits more fully in the sun. This video is produced by the U.S. Geological Survey, Cascades Volcano Observatory. Because we have such a large dome of lava in the middle, the glacier has been forced to squeeze against the walls and move quickly down the sides. So, the glacier of Mount St. Helens interacts with the lava dome in ways that we are able to study because we're able to witness this eruption during a time when we had photographs, drones, equipment, and people to monitor and take a look. Let's look at some of this footage and then we are going to build a model using peanut butter, ice cream, cookies, and candy to build up what's going on at Mount St. Helens today. Let's look at one more time lapse of the lava dome and glacier growth at Mount St. Helens between 2004 and 2012. This particular time lapse is useful because it turns the photographs into an animation called a digital elevation model or DEM. This animation was created using aerial photographs, GPS, and software to create the DEM model. You can see the date of each photograph changing in the top left corner. Let's watch this video one more time. Both the glacier and the lava dome are colored in gray, so it may be difficult to distinguish which is which. Look for the cracks in the surface of the glacier and watch as the lava do dome extrudes in the center of the crater. Watch also as it squeezes the glacier against the crater walls, forcing the glacier to move quickly. Finally, the glacier comes together. Special thanks to the USGS scientists for putting together this animation. An important aspect about the glacier that's currently growing at Mount St. Helens is the fact that it is growing in a shaded environment. When the volcano exploded, the mountain exploded to the north and the rim of the crater is on the south side. So when the sun hits the south side, it creates shade inside the crater. And that shade has helped to insulate the glacier and allow it to grow even more. If the crater was facing the opposite direction and the volcano had, for example, exploded to the south side, where the rim of the crater was on the north, then the sunlight coming in from the south would heat up the center of that crater and not be a conducive environment for glacier growth. An important aspect about the growth of the glacier at Mount St. Helens is the fact that it is growing within a crater with steep walls. These walls are constantly breaking down and there's constant stream of rocks falling from the crater rim and the sides of the crater down onto the glacier. These rocks fall and cover the glacial bed and that serves to insulate the snow and ice underneath, allowing the glacier to remain strong and full throughout the season. So the glacier at Mount St. Helens does not get the exposure in the same way that glaciers on other mountain slopes do. It is both protected from the sun because of the direction in which the crater is facing and the addition of the rocks on top 
insulate and help prevent the glacier from melting. To learn a little bit more about the Crater Glacier and the processes going on at Mount St. Helens, we're going to speak with a very important and special scientist from the U.S. Geological Survey named Carolyn Dreger. Carolyn has been a scientist with the USGS studying glaciers at Mount St. Helens for some time. In fact, she was studying glaciers at Mount St. Helens the year that the volcano erupted. When the eruption occurred, many of the glaciers that existed on the mountain were either destroyed or greatly reduced in size. And it was exciting for her and other scientists to realize that a new glacier was going to grow at an unprecedented rate. So, I'm excited to introduce today for us, Carolyn Dreger. We recorded the Zoom interview a bit earlier, and here is what she has to say about Mount St. Helens and the special crater glacier as well as her experience working and studying the mountain. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for joining us. Hi, Gina. Thanks for having me here today. And I'm really excited to talk with you about these things. You know, when you start a career, you don't know how it's going to evolve over time. And that's how it was for me. Um, I've studied glaciers. Uh, I've also worked uh, on volcanoes as well as doing outreach about volcano hazards, which is the work that I'm doing right now. So it's been a, a really fun journey. Carolyn, can you speak to your experience studying the new glacier growing in Mount St. Helens? Are there any surprises that have come up during the time that you've spent looking at this glacier? Well, first, I, I think it's really ironic that we have this, you know, this very hot rock in contact with cold glacier ice, and it just seems like they just should not work together, right? But they do. And I think one of the things that really surprised me and probably surprised a lot of other people is how tough glacier ice is. Even when hot lava rock snuggles up next to cold glacier ice, it's still most likely that that glacier ice is going to survive and it is going to thrive. And that was really surprising for us in 2004 in the eruption that happened then when we actually had hot rock blasted through the crater glacier. And in, in that, when that happened, we only had maybe four, five, six percent of the ice lost. Uh, instead of uh, melting away, uh, the, the growing lava dome pushed the ice aside, pushed the glacier aside, forced the ice to buckle up on the crater walls, and then it got a really good start and the ice was piled up there and it made a kind of a, a big marathon run down towards the north breach of the crater. And so that glacier survives today and it thrives there in the, sh in the shadow of Mount St. Helens uh, uh, crater walls. So that was really surprising to us that we now realize that the big ice age glaciers on a lot of the volcanoes in the Cascade Range have actually influenced the placement of lava flows. They've actually pushed the lava off to the sides. And so it's actually the glaciers that have been determining the shapes of these volcanoes. And so well, there's just been a lot to learn with glacier volcano interactions. Could you describe a little bit further how the glaciers at Mount St. Helens changed between the time before 1980 and then after the 1980 eruption? Well, I think that this graphic by my colleague Mindy Brugman works really well to demonstrate that. Here you can see the 11 glaciers on Mount St. Helens prior to 1980. And then uh, you can see on the other side here, this area that's within the red line, this is the area where the glaciers were, were completely destroyed. Uh, about 70% of the glaciers were destroyed, uh, roughly three quarters of them, and by the eruption in 1980. And you can see that some of them were just simply blasted away in the debris avalanche. In fact, large chunks of ice were seen down valley for many weeks after that. And then others were completely buried by rock debris and some of them were actually preserved. In fact, some of the ice that was there in 1980 is here on the volcano even today under layers of, of uh, volcanic rock. So, um, so it's been a mixture, but we did lose most of our ice 
Well, Carolyn, I'm wondering if you can speak with us today about your work studying glaciers, specifically the interactions between debris that falls on glaciers and how quickly they melt and the implications for this at Mount St. Helens. Well, Gina, that's a really good question because it turns out that there is a really important role that rock debris can play when it comes to the health of a glacier. And uh, what we recognized in 1980 was that all this ash was falling on the ice and sometimes it was really thick, it was many feet thick, uh, other times it was really thin and uh, we realized that uh, we'd have a lot of snow melt happening in some situations but there might even be flooding, we better understand this phenomena better. So uh, I looked at the effect of um, volcanic ash of, at different thicknesses uh, over time looking at at how the sun melted it out. And so I created some plots. And so uh, actually about a dozen plots and then uh, with ash of different thicknesses and then examine how much of the snow melted underneath them. So at each of these places, we found uh, over time that if you have just a little bit of volcanic ash, it acts as a black body uh, in terms of radiation and it tracks the sun, it keeps the, the heat there and it does lots of melting. If you have a really thick layer, like two inches thick or more, then we have uh, that ash being an insulator, like a nice insulating jacket. Uh, this particular picture shows a plot that we had just a little bit of ash on it. And the, I came back to it about uh, three months later. You can see that it completely melted out this really giant hole on the glacier. So that showed us that, um, you know, just a little bit of ash can do a lot of melting. Now, the way this applies to Crater Glacier is that there's a lot of rock falling from the interior crater walls at Mount St. Helens. And when it does, it falls on the ice and it makes a nice chunky insulating surface. It's like a jacket that gets put over the glacier. And this jacket keeps the glacier cool uh, away from the sun's rays. So that has allowed Greater Glacier to be a really nice, healthy, thriving glacier for, you know, uh, you know, over 30 years now. Wow. And that is a picture of you in that photograph conducting that field work. Oh, yeah, that's a picture of me doing field work. That's right. So um, back in, uh, what, 19, late 1980. Wow. <laughs> The Cascade Volcanoes were a place where we didn't, wouldn't just work, we'd go there to play as well. And so uh, climbing Mount St. Helens in 1978 and again in 1979 I, and, you know, looking at Mount Rainier off there in the distance, I just never had a clue that that entire summit was going to be blown away in 1980 and that I'd be working on some science there. Uh, but that's the way it was, and sometimes uh, those mountaineering skills that you gain from your recreational pursuits, they can actually help you with your work as well. So it was just a real natural uh, switch to go from playing on these volcanoes um, to go to working on them and understanding how to work on snow and ice and how to rope up and how to be safe on, on those glaciers and volcanic slopes. Wow, thanks for sharing those photographs. It's so exciting to see um, images of people out in the field and especially of you being out in the field and to hear about your experiment. It's really relevant for our understanding of the glacier at Mount St. Helens inside the crater today. What did the 1980 eruption and the changes that occurred at Mount St. Helens, as well as the changes in your own career, teach you about science? Gina, we learned so much about the nature of science, and I think that the public did as well. I think the public realizes that science is really worth supporting. Science is really exciting as a career. It's so, uh, there's so many interesting fields to, um, to go into. Um, but we also realize that conditions change, and there are so many new worlds to explore in science that we had not realized before. You know, new questions arise all the time. We would never have guessed we'd have a chance to look at a baby glacier uh, form and then watch its growth uh, uh, as we have. Um, we would not have asked so many questions if we had not witnessed the events of Mount St. Helens at 1980. Wow, thank you for your perspective. 
Well, thank you for having me, Gina. It's a real pleasure talking to you today. Wow. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for providing such a deep perspective on Mount St. Helens, the growth of the glacier, and your own career journey here. It is very inspiring to hear from you and your example and work as a scientist. Thank you. We are going to take a look at this phenomenon by doing an experiment involving ice cream, cookies, and candy. Again, you can find information and an activity sheet on how to do this experiment on your own on our website or follow along in this part of the video. Remember that you can pause the video at any time to gather your supplies. This experiment that we're going to show today requires creating a glacier and then freezing it and then coming back. So you won't be able to do the experiment all in one go with this video, but feel free to start your glacier, put it in the freezer, and then come back to do the rest of your experiment afterwards. Let's take a look at the experimental setup and we'll begin to build a model of the crater of Mount St. Helens. Let's build a model of the glacier in the crater of Mount St. Helens using cookies, ice cream, and peanut butter. Step one in this experiment is to crush the cookies to make rocks. Here's our experimental setup. We are going to use Oreo cookies because the volcanic rocks at Mount St. Helens contain many dark black and dark gray minerals. You can crush your cookies in a blender, or you can crush them by hand. You can also use different types of cookies and different types of candy to represent rocks. We have another little container here with some sprinkles. Those sprinkles are also going to represent rocks. Let's pour our crushed cookies into a bowl. We'll label this bowl rocks. Our process of crushing cookies models what happens in real life. There are no blenders at Mount St. Helens, but the rocks that make up the volcano are constantly breaking down due to processes of erosion. We are going to demonstrate crushing our cookies without a blender by putting cookies into a Ziploc bag and then pounding them with a hammer or a can of beans or some other heavy object to break them down. Volcanoes are constantly building themselves up during eruptions and then breaking down on a daily basis as the rocks crumble. Just as we are crushing up our cookie rocks into smaller pieces, the same processes happen at Mount St. Helens. At Mount St. Helens, rocks on the top of the volcano are constantly cracking, falling, and breaking into smaller pieces. These rocks eventually get tumbled down into rivers and eventually, one day, make it all the way to the ocean. Let's add these crushed cookie bits to our bowl of rocks. Here's a photograph of the crater rim of Mount St. Helens. Notice all the layers of lava flows, and notice also all the dark rock on top of the snow. Here is an example of some of those boulders up close, breaking down and sliding off the sides of the volcano. Another picture of the inside of the crater rim, this time with a raven flying for scale. Our next step is to build a model of the crater of Mount St. Helens as it looks today. We're going to use a bowl to represent the crater and peanut butter to represent the lava dome. Here is our crater bowl and here is our peanut butter. We're going to build a lava dome in the center of the bowl using peanut butter because the lava that extruded from Mount St. Helens after 1980 was thick and viscous, like sticky peanut butter. Use two spoons to build a small round dome of peanut butter in the center of your bowl. You can build your lava dome as high as you like. We can label it lava dome. Some lava, like what erupts from volcanoes in Hawaii, is thin and runny. 
I like to call this runny like honey style lava because it flows like honey. In contrast, the lava that erupted from Mount St. Helens after 1980 was thicker and more viscous, like peanut butter. I like to call this lava the sticky, like jiffy lava, jiffy being a type of peanut butter. Let's return to our experiment. Our next step is to build the first layer of snow around our lava dome using ice cream. We are using vanilla ice cream because it is white, like snow, but you can use whatever type of ice cream you like. At Mount St. Helens, after 1980, layers of snow accumulated on the crater floor, building on top of itself layer upon layer. Use spoons to build up layers of your ice cream into a nice thick layer that surrounds your lava dome. The snow that builds up inside the crater falls both as snow from the sky and also from the snow from the sides of the crater falling down into the crater. Thus, the bottom of the crater gets more snow than the sides of the mountain. Here are some pictures to show just how much snow accumulates on and in the crater of Mount St. Helens every winter. This photograph is taken from the rim of Mount St. Helens in the winter time. Notice the thick layer of snow on the crater rim edge. Here's a photograph of some climbers climbing along the edge of that rim of snow. This photograph is taken in August, yet there's still so much snow on the volcano edge. As the snow falls off the rim of the crater, it accumulates around the lava dome, the large bowl dome shaped object pictured in the bottom corner of this photograph. Along with snow and ice falling into the crater, rocks from the sides of the crater rim also are continuously falling into the crater. Here's an image from a photographer and artist named Frank Golke, who documented changes that happened at Mount St. Helens since 1980. This photograph captures the sunlight and dust from falling rocks and was taken inside the crater of Mount St. Helens. Frank's artwork is on display at the Portland Art Museum in their exhibit entitled Volcano, Mount St. Helens and Art. A link to view a digital version of this exhibit is on our website. Special thanks to Frank for his incredible work documenting geology in action at Mount St. Helens. This is an outstanding photograph. Next, let's look at a video of rock falling into the crater of Mount St. Helens. This video is captured by the U.S. Geological Survey and includes a graph that shows the sound. How often do you think rockfall occurs in the crater of Mount St. Helens? Well, with such deep crater walls, pretty often. Let's return to our experiment. Step four is to add a layer of cookie rocks. Here we are going to take our crushed rocks and layer them on top of the ice cream to model what happens when rocks fall from the sides of the crater walls on top of the snow at the bottom of the crater floor. This models the process that's actually taking place in the crater of Mount St. Helens today. Our next step is to turn our snow into glacial ice by compacting the ice cream glacier with a spoon. This is mimicking the real processes that occur to form glaciers in the real world. Glaciers, by definition, are formed when ice compacts and metamorphoses, when snow compacts and metamorphoses into glacial ice. You can push down your rocks and ice cream with a spoon. Step five 
step six is to repeat this process. We're going to grow our glacier by adding more snow, ice, and rocks in the form of more ice cream, cookies, and candy. We are going to pretend that many years of winters and summers are happening in our model. So every layer of snow and rocks that we add is a different summer and winter season. Each summer, rocks fall and coat the glacier, snow and ice. Each winter, more snow falls and adds to the depth of the snow of the glacier. Over time, these build up many layers in our glacier. You can build up your layers as high as you like and use whatever creative materials you like as well, as long as they are edible if you plan to eat this afterwards. The rock layers and snow layers do not necessarily fall evenly in real life, so your layers may or may not be even in your model. Get creative with your glacier. Remember also to pack it down and turn that snow into glacial ice. Just like the glacier in Mount St. Helens grew to wrap around the lava dome, you can also extend the arms of your glacier to wrap further around the peanut butter lava dome to extend the size of your glacier further. We are going to continue to add layers of ice cream and layers of cookie and candy to our glacier. During the May 1980 eruption, Mount St. Helens lost approximately 6% of its total volume. Within five months, new eruptions began to slowly reconstruct the volcano, building up the lava dome in the center. The combined eruptions of the lava dome have replaced 8% of what was lost in the 1980 eruption, but that still leaves 92% of material gone, and so the crater itself is still impressively deep. Let's add some more rocks onto the ice cream of our glacial snow. Here is an image of the crater glacier at Mount St. Helens. Can you see the layering in the glacier? The layers are created just as in our model, as dark black layers of rocks are stacked upon lighter layers of snow and ice. This is at the end of the glacier called the toe. Our next step is to cover and freeze our glacier for 30 minutes to make it more solid. You can label the first glacier that you make as glacier number one or give it a fun name. We are going to use it later for an experiment. You can cover your glacier with some plastic wrap to help keep its structure so it doesn't grow large ice crystals while in the freezer. Next, we are going to create an entirely different glacier using the same process with different amounts of ice cream and cookies. Here are two examples, one with lots of cookies and one without lots of cookies. We will test how quickly the glacier melts depending on the thickness of the rocks or, in this model, our cookies. Let's see how quickly the ice cream melts between the two different glaciers that we constructed. Here is our first glacier with lots of cookies, meaning lots of rocks on top of the glacier. Notice we see barely any ice cream melting. Here is another example of a glacier without as many rocks on top. Over time, if we watch, we see the ice cream is starting to melt and then really takes off. Without the insulation of so many cookies or rocks on top, it is easier for the sun to get to the glacier and melt it more quickly. Here starts the really fast melting.
what did you learn when you did this experiment on your own? Share your results with us at mshinstitute.org. Wow, today we learned a lot about glaciers and how they grow and why the growth of the glacier at Mount St. Helens is so important and unique. It is amazing to be able to record here in front of the volcano where, although it is now covered in clouds, we can sometimes see that glacier. I'll show some pictures at the end of this video of our crater glacier in all of its glory. A special thank you to all of the supporters that make this online education programming possible. We at the Mount St. Helens Institute partner with the U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Forest Service, the Cowlitz Indian Tribe, Discover Your Northwest. The support of all of our volunteers and staff, as well as the people who tune in to watch our videos like you, help make our programs possible. Consider donating to us to continue our ability to provide this free online programming. A special thank you as well to Carolyn Dreger. She's an outstanding and incredibly wonderful scientist and also a generous person and we appreciate so much that she took the time for an interview with us today on this series. Thank you, Carolyn. Finally, a special thank you to Mount St. Helens for being an incredibly unique place for us to witness processes occurring on our Earth and the ability to study these processes makes us all feel so very special. I hope you take this knowledge about the growth of the Crater Glacier on Mount St. Helens with you as you continue to learn more about our Earth and how it works. Thanks again for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you next time. Well, thank you for joining me. As you can see in the short period of time that we've been filming this footage, Mount St. Helens is now covered with clouds. The changes that occur in the weather here reflect how quickly some of the changes occur within the crater itself.